again everyone, this is Gilmer, and this is episode 7 of my Let's Play Pacific War. This is not War in the Pacific, although some of you might see some similarities. It is a much older game, I think, uh, War in the Pacific. Admiral's Edition came out in 2010 or so, or 2009, and Pacific War came out in 91 or 92. So about 17 years separated the two programs coming out and obviously the one that came out in 92 or 91 Pacific War is not even close to being as advanced as War in the Pacific Admiral's Edition and there was even a, a war in the Pacific before Admiral's Edition that was a lot more complicated than this one as well it's War in the Pacific is very similar to Admiral's Edition but they made Admiral's Edition a lot more complicated a lot more units a lot more uh, detail and so everybody who's ever played it and likes war in the pacific admirals edition thinks it's the best war in the pacific game ever and of course this was its predecessor in the sense of this this obviously came out very early in the war gaming on the computer lifetime or life schedule this came out when computers were still very primitive uh, a game back in 91 or 92 couldn't even run war in the pacific admiral's edition it would it, there'd be no way it could run it so we the way we run this program now this is an old dos game and the way you run this program now is by using dos box which simulates a computer running dos in a window and that's how we can play these games and uh, most of you I'm sure are familiar with DOSBox but if you're not just uh, let me know in the comments and I'll let you um, in on the quote unquote secret of DOSBox it's not really a secret it's just that a lot of people don't know about it and they will post on forums and say you know I've got this old DOS game and I can't run it on Windows well, that's because Windows and DOS are completely different, and you have to have a program that emulates DOS to actually run a game like that. And that's what um, the people that built DOSBox was, you know, that was their plan, was to run old DOS games that they still loved. And um, here we are, you know, I mean, there are so many DOS games that people still like to play that, I mean, the list is is you know too too numerous to uh, list all of them but some of my favorites were silent service 2 um, you know obviously Pacific War war um, in Russia uh, Western Front which is a war game that kind of is the predecessor of war in the West another Gary Grigsby title both of them and uh, those games West this game and Western Front and War in Russia were published under SSI. I think it was called Strategic Simulations Incorporated. And so, you know, not to mention all the, you know, Dungeon and Dragon, Dungeons and Dragons games that were put out on computer. A lot of those were DOS games. Um, and I couldn't even name some of them, the Pools of Radiance and things like that. A lot of those games were on DOS, and if you want, if you have them and ever want to play them again, you can play them on DOSBox. Um, Lord of the Rings, the uh, inter interplay version, is on DOS. You can get it and play it on DOS if you still have that, or you can actually go to some websites and and get them. I guess as abandonware. Um, I'm not positive about that. And there's just uh, so many games that were on DOS that, you know, if you have a whole, pl whole bunch of them, you can play them on this. Or maybe your father or older brother has a bunch of DOS games that he, do he or she or your mom don't play anymore. And this is uh, how you play them. So, okay, so I've talked a long time, I know. But I wanted people to kind of understand how to play the game, where these games are coming from, why people love them. I mean, they're, they're kind of bare bones, but people still love playing these games, and they're fun to play. And, you know, the, I mentioned that on somebody's 
different Steam profile just recently. They were talking about a certain game, and they were saying, you know, it's it looks good. It you know everything is detailed. It does this. It does that. And they said, but the the underlying lying problem with the game was it's not fun. And uh, I commented on their profile and told you know complimented them that you know they pointed out a game is not fun and if it's not fun why would you play it in the first place I mean it, it I don't care how complicated it is if it's not fun then you're not gonna like it and sad to say there are a lot of games out there right now that are so complicated they're not fun and this is pretty um, bare bones you know it it's you know you got your ships you got your troops and you got your bases and you're supposed to go take them and you're supposed to figure out how to take them and that's it i mean that sounds i mean it can be a little bit more difficult than that but that, that's pretty simple um and actually war in the pacific is as detailed as it is it's still simple in the sense of you've got your troops you've got your ships you've got your bases and airfields you got to go take them with what you have and the the difficulty comes in the planning of that because there's so many details in war in the pacific but i from ev what i hear most people who play war in the pacific admiral's edition love it i mean you know there's some that hate it you know because it's just too detailed and they say i can't play it it's too detailed but the ones that get into it love it and so if that's something that you're interested in the pacific war and world war ii i recommend war in the pacific admiral's edition but if you get the game be prepared because it'll take hours and hours and hours and hours you know hundreds of hours to figure it out but at the end of the day you know, which i know people hate people saying at the end of the day but after all is said and done which is another cliche uh you find out that it is a a, a fun game um, personally, I have not been able to get into it. I played a little bit of the first one, War of the Pacific, not the Admiral's Edition, and I was getting into it. I, you know, had gotten to the point where I had a carrier battle, and my American carriers they were dropping bombs, and the bombs that they were using were just bouncing off of other carriers, off of the Japanese carriers, which is historically similar to what happened early in the war. There were a lot of um, bombs and torpedoes that did not work from the American side because they were still getting the technology down. The Japanese torpedoes worked so much better and actually their bombs, their dive bombs that they used on dive, dive bottom airplanes worked a lot better than the American side because they had kind of been preparing for a war like this and they kind of knew exactly what they needed their technology to do in a war like that. But once the Americans got in, once the you know United States got into the war, they got up to see per speed pretty pretty quickly with uh, technology and you know started putting out some really good you know stuff you know material you know ships, planes, uh, weapons, bombs, things like that. Now I will say that of course it doesn't really come into play in this game or War in the Pacific. Uh, the M4 Sherman was uh, a little bit undermanned or underpowered or whatever you want to call it when it was going up against the Tigers but since we produced so many of them and it had a 75 millimeter gun it you know we overwhelmed we basically overwhelmed the Tiger tank wherever we met it and the, on the Russian side they had the T-34 which basically overwhelmed the Tigers because they produced so many of those so and plus they had a lot of really good heavy tanks on the Russian side as well they didn't produce as many as those, obviously, but the Russian technology in World War II was pretty good, especially tank-wise. So, and having said all that, we're playing this game, and I'm really concerned about this these troops here. And once they put into port, I'm going to have to split them up again to get them back on those transports. And it really kind of... It's concerning me because I really wanted some troops in this port, in this airfield, very quickly, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen, not soon enough. And 
I don't know if the Japanese will attack Port Moresby quickly enough to capture it from me. Hopefully they won't. But you never know. So I'm trying to make a decision as to whether I want to move the air camp, air combat to here and then put it on reaction range. And right now it's reaction range is one. What does reaction range do? That means that if any uh, combat force, task force, comes within one range of them, there's a chance, probably based on the admiral, as to whether it will go out and attack that because it it recognizes that there's a task force out there and, and they decide to go out and attack it because that's the what they're set to do is to go out and attack any task force that they uh, detect within one one hex of them or one box. These aren't really hexes, they're boxes, but so if I what I want to do I think is set it to go to Cairns Carnes and uh, once I get there I'm going to put their re well I guess I could probably set its reaction range move option that's the reaction range I can set it to let's go with eight let's see one two three four five five uh, so if I have him in port or in base with a reaction range of eight theoretically if a task force comes steaming around the end of this island or the edge of this New Guinea uh, my air combat would attack it it's not guaranteed and I think there are die rolls behind the scenes as to determine if it goes out and attacks them and you know it there might be 15 task forces that go through there they're not going to attack every single one of them so it all depends on uh, the the die roll behind the scenes and I mean I don't know if it puts a priority on aircraft carrier forces coming through or surface combat or what but that's what I'm going to do because I want to protect Port Moresby there's really not much else to do this turn we've got some aircraft coming into Pearl Harbor on some cargo ships we've got a we, we need to send them home actually we've got two but one of them is I wonder if we can load the rest of those CBs on yes and let's see if we can put some more supply no nope. transfer port let's put we'll use those now let's load some supply and we'll send them back to Christmas Island with um, oh crap we'll send them back to Christmas Island with some more CBs that will uh, hopefully bring them up to full strength and also give them a, a lot of supply what's their supply look like they got plenty of supply so I don't know why um, I guess because they're still very small, they haven't completely filled out yet. They haven't upgraded. Oh, wait a minute. They did upgrade at one time the airfield up to four, I mean three. So it can still upgrade to uh, four. The terrain is one, so I think four is as big as it'll get. And port, I'm not sure about that, how big it will get with a terrain of one. But this only has one more upgrade to the airfield before it's over. And then we'll use that um, the CBs to upgrade somebody else now can't know and I couldn't upgrade any more from an airfield to four so what else Cook Island could the airfield could upgrade to four NASA four as well see all of these islands their terrain is one and what that means is their terrain is real low it's you know that it's very low there's not much to it. It's not suitable to building ports and airfields on it, but you can build them a, a four. Now, on a in a place like a Spirito Santo with a terrain of six, which is kind of in the middle, 
you can build the airfield up to nine and the port I don't know how big it'll get but it could get up to you know upper numbers as well six or seven or so so that's the difference between the, the different terrains and I don't know if it has an effect on combat forces or not as you can see guys Mata can I think if the terrain is eight or two the airfield can be built up to a six so Gazmata can be built up to a pretty significant airfield alright I've talked for 15 minutes and did one thing and that was plot a movement for my air combat force so let's run a, a turn we just lost oh, we haven't lost that yet we did lose that that airfield and port is captured um, that's not good actually though what we can do is move somebody in behind to Rangoon or Mandalay and cut them off and then they'll a lot of times they'll bring their troops back and it, they're not cut off in the sense that they could still march back to that base but um, they need to take that they would need to take that base back you know and, and get all of us out of there so maybe we'll do that that's that'll give them something to think about and I'll show you that when the when it's my turn that's baton as you can see we're still bombing Rangoon we're not getting too much we're not getting too much damage in on them, but see, they keep saying supply, no damage. Um, they just damaged one of my submarines. Yeah, see, they're. Oh, no, I. Um, what happened? Damn it. I thought I plotted a surface combat to go to Andaman Island and stop anything from happening there so I guess that didn't happen it's not the end of the world I don't think but it is a little bit con disconcerting I've had Andaman take Island taken before so he can survive fairly easily even if it's taken we'll just take it back at some point And there you see they still had some Dutch troops in the Dutch East Indies. They're not too much of a match for the Japanese forces. What? One Provo Regiment? Well, I'll take a look at that and see what that is. See, they're attacking my airfields. This is the last part of the turn where they're just ret checking return paths. Yeah. So see our submarines are doing some damage. We just sunk an AV, which is I think a fleet of oil no a, a fleet replenishment. I'm not sure what an AV is, but I think AO is a fleet oiler. And AV is a fleet replenishment tank. I mean, uh, ship. Maybe we'll get some more sinks on their ships. Yep, maybe. Oh, 
maybe not. We had some contacts, we just didn't sink any. Once we hit 42, we'll start sinking some, two or three a turn. But that's not the big thing. We want to sink their, their uh, aircraft carriers. They got them in one big task force, six or so of them. And they, uh, you know, everybody, or they, it was called the Keto Bataille, or, and some people just call it the, the Starship, or the, the Death Star or something, which it's, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to, to beat that task force in the beginning of the game. Shit. Oh, we got one of their submarines, though. They sank one of our destroyer escorts. Okay. So, what do we have? Of course, our aircraft carrier didn't get there in one turn. Excuse me. And they didn't get there. So we're still waiting on them to get to Adelaide and refuel. Although they got plenty of fuel. I don't know why it's taking them so long to get there. Because they were pretty close. Then they'll be there next turn though. Alright, let's check our CMF. I'm almost positive these are transferred to another HQ so I can start loading them onto uh, troop transports. I guess it doesn't happen as quickly as I thought it did. It probably happens a little later in 42. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you how to transfer one ship to another task force. Here we have two task forces. They're both cargo ship task forces. So I want to transfer some of these ships to this one. So what I'll do is Task Force 70 is the one I want to uh, transfer sh ships into. So I'll go T for transfer and then see where it says G, get TF. G to get TF. Wait a minute. And then we'll take that one. That's how you do it. So now if you look at them, this one only has the one stack that's basically the flagship. And then this one has more cargo ships. And they're out of fuel or low on fuel. No, they're not. Uh, I'm wrong. Their total fuel is 40. Their speed is real slow, though. So we're going to send them back to San Francisco. Because we will be getting air wings, new air wings, and we will be wanting them to get. See, I think we've, I think they've given us some B-26 Marauders or B-25 Mitchells. I can't remember what what that was there before. Uh, port. Uh, some more APs. Uh, still the same armies. Uh, I think the fourth army. You can't move. Um. Actually, wow, I didn't, did I move those down here? That seems weird. They're all tied, they're all set to the 4th Army, the North Pacific, and the North Pacific. I'm wondering if you can move those guys, I wonder if you can... the 4th Regiment. Let, let's do this. Wait a minute. I'm going to split this up and then move the 4th Division or the 4th Infantry Regiment and um, I'll activate them. And then on these two, I'll divide both of these up as well. And then we'll march Uh, these two down and what that does is 
these these um, these two 137th and 113th the first of the 37th and the first of the 13th they'll stay there at the this uh, 120 and 194 and they'll work as a garrison and then these the 37th and the uh, what was it the 13th they'll rebuild into a full brigade and full regiment and um, then I can hopefully use them to um, put on transports and use them as attack troops down here with the rest of the troops I'll get eventually eventually I want to get some more infantry divisions that show up in uh, Hawaii and Pearl Harbor and we'll get the Americal division a bunch of infantry divisions and I think the first second third fourth and fifth and sixth marine divisions so we'll get a whole bunch of troops to use in this area we just haven't received them yet and then eventually I'm pretty sure these will um, detach from the CMF and go to the North Pacific or whoever they attach to I don't know so that's what's going to happen there let me show you what I was talking about in China so if I hit F3 and it shows the how they um, the land march uh, pass for, for the infantry divisions as you can see they've moved to whatever that is Kayina now I have a whole bunch of infantry divisions in that port. Now if I want to, if I march two, well let's do the, the strongest or maybe three. And then I, I don't want to attack anything. I just want them to be there. And hopefully when you move, when you move an infantry division into an, another uh, base and there's nobody there, or there's somebody there but you don't want to attack them you want to deactivate them because if they're left activated they will attack and they'll get just destroyed you don't want them to attack now the Japanese on the other hand if they have troops in there that are pretty strong they're probably gonna attack them anyway but they might not if there's if all of their troops are here and here and maybe just one divisions left back they probably won't attack so that's something I'm hoping now the problem is is that if they once they take that they'll go from there to there and I don't want to get my own troops cut off that's a real, that's different than it used to be. I don't think they could go. There was like a, a bottleneck right here. Or here. You couldn't go around like that. So that's actually something I might need. If they take this base, then I'm probably going to need to move, pull back, and then move some troops up here. Which sucks. Yeah, there's a way... SIGINT means you can get SIGINT on this base and it tells you what you can get some signal intelligence on. You can get R for Army, T for Task Force, H for Headquarters, P for Port, and A for Airfields. I want to see what kind of army they have there. So they have the 1st of the 22nd Independent Battalion, a weak combat formation in Rangoon. But there could be more, so let's do one more. No troop available. No troop. Well, so that means they're probably pretty weak there, but there's probably a good chance they got a strong division there. I probably should have tried to check that. Well, all right. I think I'm going to end this uh, video. I hope I've, you know, made you want to check into this further. If you have the game, I hope it makes, you know, I hope you might have learned anything from what I just, 30 minutes of just talking helped. And um, 
If it didn't and you still have some questions, you're welcome to ask in the comments. I'll try to answer as many as I can. Um, holy crap. I've never seen that before. What the hell are they doing there? A guerrilla army? The Philippine guerrilla army is in the eastern U.S.? That's weird. I have never seen that. Look at that. Experience 90. Ready this 99. That's a that's a strong force right there. It's gorilla, so it doesn't have much. It doesn't have any any AV, AFVs, and it has 20 artillery. Here's my list of American generals. Uh, I've got a couple of decent ones. Major General Buckner and Major General Wainwright. And I think a couple more come on that are pretty good later on that we'll, we'll be using. And their ratings actually can go up. So if you get into a battle and they win their battle, their, their actual land ratings can increase to a, a maximum of, of nine. So that's something to think about when you're doing uh, land attacks. Is uh, it's a it's a good way if you have like a battle you know you're gonna win. Let's say I had eight divisions here and the Japanese have one battalion. So you know you're gonna win that battle. You you can put in a weaker general to kind of build his. Uh, experience up and get his land rating up so that you have several good generals as opposed to just using one over and over and over so that's something to think about later on in the game anyway um this video is over thank you very much and i will see you next time